I used the air cooled CPU cooler, not like I didn't feel quite comfortable enough yet to run like all sorts of liquid through my <laughs> machine. I, I figured so, that yeah. I, you know, knowing myself, I would break a tube and like ruin everything in my computer. And actually I looked, there was some study I found, I actually probably couldn't find it again. And maybe it was just confirmation bias, but I found like, I think it was some YouTube video showing how the air coolers, the good air coolers will actually cool better than a lot of the cheaper water coolers or radiators. So that gave me some confidence there. Bandwidth for Change Log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. Our feature flags are powered by LaunchDarkly. Check them out at LaunchDarkly.com. And we're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Get $100 in hosting credit at Leno.com slash changelog. What up, friends? You might not be aware, but we've been partnering with Linode since 2016. That's a long time ago. Way back when we first launched our open source platform that you now see at changelog.com, Linode was there to help us, and we are so grateful. Fast forward several years now, and Linode is still in our corner, behind the scenes helping us to ensure we're running on the very best cloud infrastructure out there. We trust Linode. They keep it fast, and they keep it simple. Get $100 in free credit at linode.com slash changelog. Again, $100 in free credit at linode.com slash changelog. Welcome to Practical AI, a weekly podcast that makes artificial intelligence practical, productive, and accessible to everyone. This is where conversations around AI, machine learning, and data science happen. Join the community and Slack with us around various topics of the show at changelog.com slash community, and follow us on Twitter. We're at Practical AI FM. Welcome to another fully connected episode of Practical AI, where Daniel and I keep you fully connected with everything that's happening in the AI community. We'll take some time to discuss the latest AI news and we'll dig into learning resources to help you level up on your machine learning game. My name is Chris Benson. I'm a principal emerging technology strategist with Lockheed Martin. And with me, as always, is my co host, Daniel Whitenack, who is a data scientist at SIL International. How's it going today, Daniel? It's going great. It's a little bit interesting. You know, Chris, we haven't done one of these fully connected episodes in a while where it's just you and I. So for those listeners that have been with us for a while, you'll remember we, Chris and I used to somewhat frequently, maybe every few episodes, have an episode with just Chris and I and no guest and discuss some news things or learning resources or random topics. But we haven't really done that in a while. So it seems so nostalgic. So it, it is, but this is a good one. <laughs> this is one we have been talking about doing for quite a long time, because um, you you were working on on developing your own AI workstation and you built it from scratch, and we yeah. heard a bit of progress across several episodes there. Yeah, in uh, in the intros to a few episodes, I mentioned that I was building a um, an AI workstation, and actually ended up. So I have a few computers sitting around me that um, one of those is that workstation I was mentioning. Another one is, we can talk about that one as well, actually. But uh, yeah, it's been a bit of uh, an interesting journey. And I think, you know, at least news-wise, maybe some people are thinking about this these days, but NVIDIA's latest release with their 30 series GPUs, actually even today, I was talking to someone who was trying to get their hands on one and there's like none anywhere. So this is what is this, November 10th as we're recording this uh -huh. of 2020? And I forget when they released those. I think it was in maybe September, but they've been pretty scarce. And I think what happened is the, so there were the lower tier ones, I think primarily geared towards gamers and those basically sold out instantly. And so then the ones that were like, I think the 3090, the, the higher tier ones that were geared towards like AI training and stuff, the gamers then just started going to those and basically everything sold out for anyone. And uh, this morning um, I was on a call with a guy and he was like, we were taking the call while he had Best Buy pulled up and like he was getting notifications when they would 
like release some on Best Buy, but he never got one. So like he, you know, went into the thing and uh, pushed the add to cart and then they make you wait. And then by uh-huh. the time you're like, you're waiting in the queue is done. And then, you know, your cart opens and it's sold out and no longer available. Yeah. It was kind of a vicious cycle like that. So you went virtually shopping with him on his. his yeah. Uh, yeah. He screen yeah. shared and everything. So we got the oh, experience wow. together. Um <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was you don't just have your own frustrations you get to share in his frustrations right, too. exactly exactly very good so yeah for um m- maybe listeners that are newer to to ai which we'll we'll go into this a bit with the workstations but um a lot of people use um gpus and uh specifically nvidia gpus to accelerate their workloads in particular training is a big thing to accelerate inference as well but um training mainly. So when people are building their computers for uh, training deep learning models or AI models, a lot of times they're in the market for a GPU and such are not available (laughs) at this time as we've been discussing. So that makes things a challenge. Actually, uh, I mentioned I have the one workstation. Um, So I guess I can kind of talk now about the the things that got set up this fall. Yeah. So I have the one workstation that I built that has two GPUs in it. And I've been using that for training models. Um, And then I've got a separate one, which is, it doesn't have a GPU in it, but I've been using it. We've been training models for um, Intel-based edge devices. And so I've got this Intel machine, which actually is fairly beefy, but to test those models on an Intel-based architecture um, without a GPU, for inference, but also it's got a bunch of RAM for like pre-processing and things like that. Um, and I can kind of talk about how I've experienced both of those, but those are the two things that I've been using recently. And so I really haven't done much other than connect from my laptop to those machines while I've been working recently. And that's some interesting um characteristics, I guess is the right word. I I don't know if I would call them features, but interesting workflow implications as well. Well, you're diving into that now. So you gotta, you gotta tell us a little bit about what. Yeah. I mean, this is not really AI or computer. Well, I guess it's, I guess it's computer related, but so I SSH into either one of these machines or actually on the workstation, Sometimes I SSH in and just run jobs, and sometimes I'll connect to a Jupyter server. Um, the other machine, I can SSH in or actually even just connect a monitor and work on it directly. Yeah, I, we have Comcast um, Xfinity internet here. And, you know, just like the home internet network, I have the Xfinity router. So just the one that comes from the ISP. And I guess they assume that most people aren't going to be wanting to like connect in that way to, <laughs> yeah. or, or like when I am at my wife's business, she owns a manufacturing business. And uh, when I'm there and I want to connect back home to my AI machine, then I have to open up a port in our home network. Right. And then do a, this port forwarding thing. And all of that's kind of, it would say, difficult in the yeah. uh, Xfinity yeah. firmware that's on that router. So our listeners may also remember that I installed a new network at my wife's business, which has some really great network appliances and ubiquity gear. And so I'm thinking actually of taking both of these machines and maybe just like putting them in the IT closet at her work. Yeah. And then whenever I need to connect just SSH into that network and find the computers. I think that's actually the better solution. That, that's like the workflow of things that I mentioned in terms of connecting to them. Gotcha. And, and for what it's worth, for those out there who may not be intimately familiar with that, the two-second explanation on SSH is a secure connection to a remote computer. And you talked about going through your router and having to open ports. And those are like doorways you might think of on your router where you have to you have to open them, you have to have access to that, and they have to be able to connect to each other. So there's a lot of plumbing. It's, uh, yeah. it's internet connection plumbing to make work. Yeah. And uh, when you spin up a Jupyter server, let's say locally, or you type like Jupyter space notebook on your, yep. on your terminal, and that spins up a local server. And you might notice if, if a tab pulls up in your browser, normally it'll say like localhost 8888. Yep. That's the host and the port. So I'm just 
connecting to that host running the Jupyter server, but it's a remote computer, not the local host on the, on the same machine. Gotcha. And I have a question before we move off of this. I know this isn't the primary topic, but do you ever have a reason to get on and do the actual work on the workstation itself locally? Or do you always come in from your laptop through a port and use the workstation as a remote server in that way? Yeah, I I haven't really done that much. I don't really have much installed on the workstation other than Ubuntu is the OS, uh, Linux OS. And then I have Docker installed and then the like CUDA libraries and such for the GPU. And so there's really not much, it's not meant to be a, you know, a primary work, primary interface. workstation yeah, sure. with all sorts of things installed on it necessarily. So yeah, I haven't really connected to it in that way outside of when I very first set it up and booted it up before all of that, I, I um, connected up a monitor and keyboard and mouse and that sort of thing. Gotcha. So you're kind of using it as a remote SSH server to do the work and you're still on your laptop Yep. when you're doing that, but it's providing those resources. Yep, exactly. And I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't use it in that way, but also if you're doing like, if you're using this workstation primarily for those types of workloads, like training workloads and that sort of thing, if you're pulling up a monitor and you have like 17 Chrome tabs up, And like it's eating away at the memory and then like you also have, you know, the GPUs then potentially supporting various graphics operations. Not that it's consuming a lot in terms of the same amount that training consumes, but um, it's just not optimized. So, yeah, there's really not anything running on there other than than those few things that I mentioned. Gotcha. So I guess what was your motivation for doing it this way, because we have talked, and anyone who's Uh listened to a number of our episodes, prior to you doing this, we kind of, for a while, were talking about, you know, really focusing on, you. we have all three major cloud providers out there with all these services. I remember us having conversations going, ah, why do it elsewhere and stuff. Clearly, you had a change of heart (laughs) at somewhere along the way. So what was it that motivated you to do this? That's a great question. I think there were a few things. Um, It wasn't any one particular thing. The first, which is not really practical in any way, is just because my brother-in-law was building a new gaming computer and I was kind of watching him do that and we were talking about it. And I kind of realized that, you know, back in college, I guess it would have been, would have been the last time I built a personal computer of, of any kind. Right. And I used to do that, you know, fairly frequently, especially since I was in um, I worked as an IT person at my college. And so I I would do that fairly frequently or dig into the you know guts of computers fairly yeah. frequently and switch out parts and whatever. I did, too, in college, but that was yeah. a different time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I won't ask about that. Uh, yeah. No, you, don't wanna, you don't want you don't want to go back to the age of dinosaurs. You know, no, no, definitely not. I really enjoyed doing that back then. And I realized I had, I just hadn't done it forever. And so part of it was like all of these new parts and how things have updated. Everything's different now. Um, there's a different spin on all sorts of things. You know, hard drives are different. They don't have like these spinning bits in them, which they always did. Yeah. Platters. Yeah. I remember uh, in high school, college, we would take old hard drives and take the tops off and then we yeah. had like action figures and we duct tape the action <laughs> figures to the drives and then like put little uh, swords or something in their hands and then, you know, spin them both up at the same time. And the last one standing would, uh, you know, win the prize <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so kind of a centrifugal force contest, right? Yeah, there. exactly. Who, who survived exactly. the longest. Who can like, yeah. Yeah. Got it. Very yeah. good. At least you found a use. You were the only person on the planet who has found a use for these old hard drives rather than just checking them. I will say that the network video recorders and a lot of file servers now, I think still use those types of drives. They'll have 12 slots for um, regular, you know, spinning hard drives. You know, when you have like that much data, it doesn't need to be accessed quickly. It's just cheap storage. Gotcha. But um, I totally forget where where we are. Oh, uh, the motivation for <laughs> got into action figures on it's hard drives. F- it's fine, I, you know. Yeah, come back from the action figures. Uh, why build? 
Yeah, so the second reason was a lot of the stuff I'd been doing up until this summer was natural language processing text-based, though. So text corpora or data sets are generally fairly small in terms mm-hmm. of size. Compared and, to audio or, or video for other non-NLP. Yeah, compared to audio or video. Yeah. But uh, I've been doing a lot of speech projects this year. And so also having a system where I could run something, you know, for four or five days and do that over and over and over and over without, you know, incurring the cloud costs. Yeah. So there's a crossover. There's a break even point. Yeah, there's a break even point. So even I think when I did the research, there are some really great affordable, I mean, depending on your definition of affordable, but there are some cheaper manageable solutions for using GPUs in the cloud. One of those was paper space, which I was using before for longer training runs. Um, That's a really great Mm -hmm. system uh, that integrates with a lot of things now. I think even like Hugging Face Transformers, I saw an article about an integration there. And that's easy to use. I like the design pattern there. And they have integrated notebooks and all of that. There's also Google Colab and things like that where you can even get free GPU usage. Yeah. Our organization uses um, G Suite. And so we have access to team drives and all of that. So I would occasionally save, you know, Colab notebooks and other things and work on them with people in that setting. Yeah. So there is a break even point. And I think I kind of calculated out a bit of what we were going to need to run. And we were sort of right at that break even point. And I knew, you know, we were kind of pushing our limits in terms of the, the cost. So so you actually did an analysis, though, at least a back of the napkin kind. Right. To figure out what your break even would be. So like it was something like, you know, over a summer, you know, we were going to spend at least, you know, eight to twelve thousand dollars on GPUs in the cloud for training that would be kind of the lower range. And, you know, when I started looking at blog posts about now, some deep learning workstations that you'll get from that are like pre-built, we can talk about that too, are not going to be a cost savings with respect to that. But you can also, if you sort of roll your own and build your own, um, you can get into a lower cost zone with that. And that's one of the things that we can talk about moving forward. Gotcha. So in the end, it was just a simple, but was that the whole enchilada, so to speak? Was that was basically you figured out that your crossover, your break even point made it make sense after that. And then as soon as you got to that point, that was it. Anything else that contributed? I think those were the two main things. Um, I also knew that there were a couple other people coming onto our team that would need this sort of resource. So, you know, when I'm, you know, not running things, uh, it could also benefit others on the team that uh, needed GPU resources and, you know, we're either going to pay for those or get their own machine. So. Changelog++ is the best way for you to directly support practical AI. Join today and unlock access to a private feed that makes the ads disappear, gets you closer to the metal, and helps sustain our production of practical AI into the future. Simply follow the Changelog++ link in your show notes or point your favorite web browser to changelog.com slash plus plus. Once again, that's changelog.com slash plus plus. Changelog++ plus plus. better. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked about why you chose to do it, let's actually get into the machine itself a bit and let's talk about what you built. So, you know, in any way you want, just take us through uh, a rundown of what it is that you've done and, and, and maybe some of the choices along the way. Yeah, sure. So I'm actually going to, while we're talking, I'm going to pull up a couple links where I started uh, my research. So originally when I was looking at this, I was like, you know, do I really want to sort of roll my own workstation and get all the parts and do all that or just get a really cool 
workstation that is still going to be really cool and sit by my desk, but, you know, isn't going to require sort of all of that work. Um, so I started looking at places like uh, Lambda Labs or System76. Mm-hmm. They have these sort of pre-built uh, deep learning workstations with, you know, four, eight GPUs, different, you know, configurations. And I really like the look of those and what you could do with them. But when I started calculating out the cost, it was going to be, you know, pushing ten to twelve thousand dollars, which rightfully so they need to make, you know, profit on those. And there is a significant amount of work in terms of, you know, fabrication of what they're putting together and like the design in that and making sure it's um, maintainable and all that. But I was looking at definitely a lower price tag than that in terms of what I could accommodate. So I found a a couple of blog posts that appealed to me right out of the bat. The first one of these was from a guy named Jeff Chen, who is out in California. I I believe at the time he wrote the blog post, he was um, at university doing research. It's from 2019, and the title is How to Build the Perfect Deep Learning Computer and Save Thousands of Dollars, which is obviously very appealing to me. The next uh, set of blog posts was from a guy named uh, Curtis Northcutt. Actually, uh, he has a few different builds, but one of them he talks about the best four GPU deep learning rig only costs seven thousand dollars, not eleven thousand dollars. So if you remember, I was kind of looking at those pre-built ones around eleven thousand dollars. I didn't think I needed four GPUs in terms of the initial workloads I was going to run. So I thought maybe I could also bring it a little bit under that. So under that price point. So my thought was I could follow something like these blog posts talked about and get a workstation up and running for much less than what we would be spending over the summer in cloud costs if we were to run our workloads there. Um, But also I wanted to get it expandable for the future, I guess. So Mm -hmm. Um, start out with maybe two GPUs, but also have it expandable to maybe four GPUs because I knew, you know, our workloads might expand or more team members might come on the team eventually and that sort of thing as well. So quick question there. Uh, you you mentioned, you know, kind of that you knew that you really only needed two right now. You wouldn't need the four. As an aside real quick, how did you make that evaluation? <laughs> Yeah, not in a high tech way. Okay. And so my logic on that front was as follows, which um, is maybe not the best logic to follow. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I can hear him caveating all the way through this. You just finger in the air kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah. And I should uh, maybe I'll just make a general disclaimer that I'm not a hardware person. So a lot of the choices I made, I'm sure I'll have people come into our Slack channel and be like, why did you do that? Why did I'm sure. And I already know a couple of things that I would change if I could, which we can go into those later. Yeah, we'll get into that in a bit. So this was a learning process for me. I'll just disclaimer that. But my thought process in terms of the two GPUs was that I didn't yet want to worry about multi GPU trainings consistently. I've found in the past that generally the time I sink into getting multi GPU accelerated training working. I mean, that's it's more complicated. And the time I put into that can be saved by just sort of loading that workload into a single higher tier GPU. So a lot of times I find that it's most easy to just do single GPU training, but on a higher tier GPU, than do like multi GPU trainings all with lower tier GPUs, if that makes sense. Got it. So yeah. So let me ask this. Do you, so is it fair then to say that your training runs are, since you have two GPUs, you're doing two concurrent training runs uh, versus doing a single one where you're yep. using both of the GPUs there? So this is the second logic with this is that I knew that primarily on these speech projects, I was working with a single other main developer on this work. And so my thought process with that was while I'm running something on GPU one, he can be running something on GPU two. Got it. So that's where the two came from was the fact that I assumed we would be doing mostly single GPU runs and uh, that there were two of us. Okay. no, fair enough. Yeah. And, you know, at some point it would be interesting for me. I would like to try some multi GPU stuff. 
when I looked into this, there's a whole like rabbit hole you can go down there on is. this front um, because like certain cards. So I actually have two different GPU cards in the machine. The, one is different from the other one. There's a 2080 Ti and a Titan RTX. And those you actually, so there's a special link between GPU cards called an NV link, which is, I think, in my understanding, the best way to communicate data between the two cards. Yeah. Uh, the fastest way. Yeah. And that, that's an NVIDIA technology between uh-huh. the two cards that for networking. That's my understanding. Just for those who aren't familiar with it. That, yeah. that a, it's proprietary technology from NVIDIA that gets you that great throughput for training purposes. Yeah. So eventually I'd like to try something with that. I think my understanding is that if you don't use that link, the sort of standard link through the motherboard, you don't always get the sort of boost that you might expect because of the communication bottlenecks between the cards. Yeah, and that's my understanding as well. Yeah, so eventually I might like to try that, but it may depend also on future workloads that that I'm running and what's needed there. So Gotcha. Yep, so that, that was the logic behind that, which meant that I needed a motherboard in the workstation that could support two GPUs but I also wanted it to be expandable. Expandable, right? I remember you mentioned that. Yeah, so the blog post by Jeff Chen, who, Jeff, if you're listening to this, thank you for your blog post. Reach out if, if you are listening. We'll grab you a shirt. But it talks about all sorts of things, and it probably some of it is, um, so I noticed some of the things, like some of the parts had even been updated since he... Um, wrote the post, but most of it was still relevant when I went through. And he also talks about trade-offs and he um, goes down and he talks about expandable. So uh, making sure that you build things expandable and that sort of thing. So that's where I kind of got that idea. What I ended up doing was getting uh, a motherboard, which actually, uh, this reminds me. So in our show notes, I think one of our listeners asked for this at some point in our Slack channel too. I'll post the part list that I used in our show notes if anyone's curious about the parts that I use. So um, don't feel like you have to frantically write down part numbers or something. And I would probably mispronounce the names anyway, but I'll, I'll put the parts list in, in our show notes. But it was from a Gigabyte Motherboard. And I don't know how to say this. This is going to be where my ignorance comes in. A Aorus? A- Aorus, A O R U S. Good no, I have no idea. <laughs> and so that that supported uh, f- actually four. So I could I could run four, although it seems like a tight fit. I don't know if it's just like me and my inexperience and not knowing that like things are that tightly fitting. I could definitely fit four, I think. But right now I have t- two spaced out so there's a slot in between the two that i have in there there's actually a slot on the bottom and then i have one in the next slot up and then there's a empty slot and then the final one so they're actually spaced out a bit if i were to put all four in there now seeing that they would be pretty tightly packed so depending on ventilation stuff that may be an issue that's what i was gonna ask you know coming at it from someone who also does not do hardware and has not built a system in quite a while but you know, having previously put NVIDIA cards in that had big fans and things yep. like that, is that still, when you talk about slotting it in, is that including those ventilation capabilities or is that without that? Yeah. So as I learned, there's a bunch of options here as well. And there's two main types of cards. There's actually a blower style card, which yep. pulls in air from one side and actually shoots it through the card and out the back of the computer. And then there's another style, which people might see in pictures, where there's like two or more fans on the bottom and it just sort of blows down. Like it blows from top to down and draws air away from the card. So this is actually um, really interesting. On Curtis Northcutt's blog, he talks about double deep learning speed by changing the position of your GPUs. And when he's talking about position, he's actually talking, he has a mix of blower style and non-blower style GPUs. And so what happens is when you put one of those non-blower style GPUs on top of another one, it actually just blows the heat into the other one and heats it up and it degradates performance. So the positioning is actually really important here. 
in terms of managing the, the heat on those. So you kind of want to shoot for those blower style, at least depending on how many you're going to have and how you position them, you're going to want to worry about that positioning and the flow of air. Obviously, uh, actually, you know, this is one of my noob moves as well, but I ordered case fans and I thought I was just getting like a case fan, but the the order that I did on Amazon, it was like actually a pack of four. So I, I ordered what I thought was two case fans and I ended up with like eight. Okay. So I just plugged in as many fans as I could into the motherboard. And yeah, I, I forget how many I ended up with, but there's there's a lot. So that's it. Yeah, the, the ventilation and all of that is definitely a big deal with the GPUs. So are, are there variances, though, in, in, in what you saw? Maybe you didn't uh-huh. have a big enough sample, but in motherboard design, I mean, it, clearly that can have a, a fairly profound uh, impact yeah. on what your GPU can do or GPUs can do. Yep, that's a great point. So I'm speaking a little bit outside of my domain of expertise here, but um, this is what I learned off of sort of blog posts and that sort of thing. One of the things you want to look for with your motherboard is what it talks about with PCIe lanes. Yep. So this is, in my understanding, the sort of lanes of communication between your CPU and various other things that are connected to your motherboard, like your hard drives or or other things. So what's going to happen is when you start adding GPUs, you're going to start filling up those lanes. So according to, you know, the Jeff Chen blog post, as a general rule, this is probably not true, maybe across the board, but as a general rule, you might think that each GPU requires at least eight of those PCIe lanes. And so what you have to do is you have to find a combination of CPU because that determines some compatibility with the motherboard. So combination of CPU, then a combination of motherboard that gives you enough PCIe lanes to support the number of GPUs that you need to support. So there's a little bit of arithmetic there, nothing too complicated, but you have to be sure because some CPUs and motherboard combinations, the pairing will not support the needed number of PCIe lanes that you need to run those. Um, And then also run, so I added a solid state drive for my hard drive and I've actually on my desk, I have a second one because I already filled it up. That's one item on my didn't do it right list. We'll get to that in a few minutes. So I have a solid state drive and that that also, you know, takes up some of those. I have an M.2 solid state drive, which is just a little bitty, you know, gum stick mm-hmm. sized hard drive. Um, and that requires a certain number of lanes. So you also want to think about, you know, your storage and that sort of thing, and how much RAM um, you need to support in the machine as well. All of that stuff went into the motherboard, and I just kind of took some recommendations from various blog posts on that. Again, I'm not, uh, I don't follow this stuff yep. religiously, so I don't, I don't know all of what's out there. But I, I was able to find a, a combination that worked. Do you have a current list? I know you're going to put it uh-huh. onto the show notes, but I'm just curious if you can highlight each of the, you know, what the RAM was, sure, you know, sure. at least size wise, that kind of stuff. And, yep. and just give us the highlights without going too deep. Yeah, here's the highlights. The motherboard I mentioned, the CPU I got was actually, uh, so this is one thing that probably looking back, I would change. For some reason at the time, I got a Ryzen Threadripper CPU and not that it's bad. It actually works quite nicely. So it's an AMD chip. I think looking back, especially with my experience with the other Intel machine that I have, Uh I would go back and change that to an Intel CPU. And we can talk a little bit more about that here in a second. But that was the CPU I used. Then I ended up using a total of four sticks of RAM for a total of 64 gigabytes of RAM. And then I have one of the M.2 solid state drives, which is a terabyte uh, Samsung drive. One of the other things you have to be careful about with this is the power supply. You need enough power to power the GPUs and all of that as well. So that was actually one of those things that turned out to be more expensive than I thought in terms of looking around and finding an appropriate. I ended up 
choosing one that actually someone already gave me some feedback, I think in our Slack channel, maybe it's not the best yeah. power supply, but it does the job of uh, Rose Will Hercules and then some case fans. I use the air cooled CPU cooler, not like I didn't feel quite comfortable enough yet to run like all sorts of liquid through my <laughs> machine. I, I figured so, that yeah. I you know, knowing myself, I would break a tube and like ruin everything in my everything in my computer. So um, and actually I looked it's there was some study I found. I actually probably couldn't find it again. And maybe it was just confirmation bias. But I found like a, um, I think it was some YouTube video showing how the uh, CPU or the air coolers, the good air coolers will actually cool better than a lot of the cheaper water coolers or radiators. So that gave me some confidence there. So now that you've kind of talked about these components and you started to tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've learned and might change as you've gotten some education, kind of go back through and what would you do different? You know, you've already started on that line, but I'm kind of yep. curious. There's a big learning process that you had to go through this yep. and neither one of us are hardware people. So what kind of what do you know now that you didn't know before? Yeah. So there's a couple of things that probably the funniest thing is my case doesn't close. Um, so <laughs> how does that, got, does that affect the airflow then? And the well, cooling? I think that, I mean, if anything, it Im- improves the airflow or at least that's what I tell myself. So I got a case, um, is actually, I think it's the same case that from that blog post that I keep mentioning. And I yeah. was like, well, I don't want to worry about like finding a different one. I'll just use the same case. But what I didn't realize is, um, so that each of the GPUs, at least the certain GPUs require power directly to the side of the GPU. And the power cables I got with my power supply are fairly rigid. Yeah. They're not like super bendy. Yeah. So when I bring them in the side, they kind of stick out the side and I can't close my case. They're that rigid? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, they're, yeah. They do make these little like 90 degree connector deals. You can buy... Basically, I just I got it up and running and set the side of the cases, you know, to one side. And I haven't really looked back. Probably at some point, maybe I would look into those, but or or like bendy cables or just a larger case. It's a pretty big case, but it's that point like between the motherboard and the GPUs and the the case that width, it, it could actually expand out in the case the other way. So that's one thing, just that spacing. But I mentioned this other machine that I've been running, which is I actually really enjoy doing stuff on this machine. It's a Intel based machine that we're using to as a target system, you know, to test out certain of our pre-trained models for inference and test out our applications on there. And um, we have some speech applications we're testing and that sort of thing. It's one of these um, Intel based uh, Nuke computers they're like little small computers Mm -hmm. and they have i think the one i have has an i7 intel i7 processor in it no gpu in it um but it has a a lot of ram so 64 gigabytes of ram and i found a lot of the sort of speech processing and pre-processing stuff on there is super fast i really like the performance on there not that it's amazingly slow on my workstation. That's sort of our target system for our applications is an Intel based system. Mm -hmm. And so at the time when I was building the workstation, looking at what was available online for building these, you know, I could get an Intel based motherboard and processor, but it was a price hike. Right. Um, And looking back, I would tell myself to just go ahead and take that price hike. Um, because if that was the case, I wouldn't constantly be moving models around between these two systems to do my testing. And, you know, the Intel, the way I understand it, like the Threadripper has, the AMD chip has more cores. And so if you're doing a lot of multi-threaded stuff, it's really good. But the single core speed on the Intel processors is higher. And so depending on what your workload is, then you could actually get a performance boost, even though you have fewer cores, but with a higher core speed with the Intel. So all of that stuff, it's, 
you know, it seems to work a little bit better for me. And this is just my own personal experience. This is all inference you're talking about here, right? So inference, but also pre-processing. So CPU, okay. I'm doing all my pre-processing on this machine too. And pre-processing is also, you know, part of that CPU workload that you have to consider. And I use um, Intel's uh, OpenVINO toolkit to optimize the models for running on Intel CPUs. So if mm -hmm. all of that was in a single workstation, like I had the Intel CPU, the motherboard, um, and I could do the pre-processing, I could do the model optimization, all of that together rather than sort of swapping back and forth or, or doing that in separate places. I think that just the saving in terms of my workflow would be useful. So that may be one thing to keep in mind is like those other pieces of your workflow, like optimizing your model for certain hardware or yep. pre-processing pre as well. Those are things that you need to think about. You know, those are equally valid things to think about when you're designing a system. So before, just as an aside, since you're kind of, kind of touching on it for a second, if you look at what your existing workflow is from beginning to end and the, cho the choices that you've made, what are each of the big pieces, like what frameworks yeah. are you using and all that, yeah. uh, just to throw it out there so that people yeah. can get a context for it. Yeah, so we're using both TensorFlow and PyTorch in our work. It depends on the certain application, but we have a couple of different products that we're developing that include multiple models in each of these products. Some of them are TensorFlow models, some of them are PyTorch models. And we have both text and speech pre-processing elements that are in there as well. We generally save most of our training data in Amazon S3 or DigitalOcean Spaces, some object store. And then we'll pull that down to the machine and pre-process it and then save that pre-processed data for training and testing and evaluation. We'll save that actually on the workstation. That way we don't have to constantly be pulling from some remote source for the data. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we have that locally, then we can iterate on our model training, whether that be with TensorFlow or PyTorch. That's all done within Docker. Like I mentioned, we don't actually have really much at all installed on the machine itself. Right. So we pull down a, a TensorFlow or PyTorch or our own custom Docker image, run that. We haven't had any issues in terms of connecting to the GPUs with Docker. Um, so that that's worked out great. Are you basing it on, on uh, NVIDIA Docker containers? Sometimes, yeah. So sometimes we have our own custom containers we're using as well. Or like I mentioned, sometimes we also have containers for certain optimization frameworks that we're using, like o Intel's OpenVINO or others that optimize right. our models for certain targets. Those are sort of a mix. And then after that, in the products we're building, we have a custom way of bundling our models together in what we call a model bundle for a specific deployment. Um, and so that model bundle needs to be built and encrypted, and then that's actually pushed back out to our object store in S3 or DigitalOcean spaces, depending on the application. Um, and that model bundle is saved there. Then for deployments of that system, that would then pull down that model bundle from the object store and run with that. So earlier when we were talking about motivations and you talked about the break even there, you know, you kind of figured out what made sense, but obviously, uh, when you made the choice and you're not going with cloud because the break even in that case, what are you thinking in terms of your upgrade? You know, because we talked about, uh, you know, being able to fill in with more GPUs yeah. uh, and enhance the capability of the box. But what about over time as, as GPUs start to age? What's your thinking there? And, you know, that makes that a, a good choice from your standpoint. Yeah, I mean, right now um, I have no choice there because I can't get my hands on any more GPUs because they're all it's a good answer. They've all <laughs> ceased to exist on the face of any <laughs> website on the yeah. internet. Um, yeah. So I I can't get my hands on any. But um, I think right now we're in a pretty comfortable spot in terms of the workloads that we're running. However, we're ramping up some of the work on these prototypes that we built. And I'm guessing if those kind of catch on and are productized a little bit more, then we'll have a need for an interesting new work 
flow, which is a bit more automated. Um, so right now, most of what we've been doing on this machine, at least, is prototyping work and preparing very custom deployments um, for very sp specific applications. In the end, we're going to build a bit more of an automated workflow where, for example, one of the things we're doing is spoken language identification. So audio comes in and then we detect what language is being spoken in that audio clip. And so if, for example, in a certain application, we want these four languages instead of the six languages that we originally had in our model, we want to be able in a very quick way to spin up a pipeline that would redo the training with sort of different combinations of data. And so that's something that I think would be interesting. I know we've had a couple of conversations recently. I, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, one of those, we, we've talked to the, the Pachyderm crew before on the podcast. They have a great pipelining uh, system. Definitely. We've also talked to, I remember Allegro AI has a yep. sort of uh, training and automation system that you can run mm -hmm. on an on-prem instance. Um, and so that may be another option that I can install that Allegro system on the workstation and run it that way. Um, there's a lot of different options there that we could possibly use. Um, and also upgrading the sort of um, monitoring there. Right now, um, that process is fairly manual as well. So maybe utilizing either, like I mentioned, um, maybe something more than tensor board. So we just had a conversation with Weights and Biases CEO, um, sure did. Lucas Bewald, and he talked about the great stuff that they're doing. And you know, all of that's, I think, not too hard to implement in that workflow. So those are some of the things on my mind. So, you know, as we're closing out here, you know, at this point, would you do the whole thing over again? Because it sounds like you've learned a lot. There's definitely some cost advantages to what you've done. But I also know that as we recorded various episodes over the weeks that you were engaged in this, that, you know, there was a lot of work involved. <laughs> there was. As you were kind of statusing along the way. Was it worth it? I think it depends on, I mean, of course, your need, but also your personality. I really enjoyed this. It was something that I found a lot of enjoyment in. And I think that was worth it in and of itself. But if I was to look back, I would definitely do it again. And I think, you know, the things like I mentioned that I would kind of tell myself in retrospect is, you know, don't skimp on the CPU or the RAM and over project your data storage. So go ahead and get yourself whatever it is, four terabytes or, you know, whatever it is, something that you're not going to fill up quickly as soon as you start working with speech or video data or something like that one terabyte. It seems like a lot, but it's not. It turns out, you know, it's easier than you think to fill up that space. So get yourself, even if it's some um, cheaper hard drives that can be just sort of cold storage, um, do that. But yeah, it was a fun experience and I would definitely recommend doing it. You know, it's, it's fun to have that sitting, you know, by me in my, now my home office. And, you know, now we don't have to heat our house quite as much. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's just winter, so it's good timing. <laughs> Side benefits you get there. Okay, well, that was pretty cool. It's a long overdue, this conversation. I'm looking forward to seeing what listeners uh, inform us because, you know, both of us are, uh, this is not our yeah, specialty. Be gentle. Uh, be, gen <laughs> be gentle on Daniel. It'll be interesting, though, to see what we get in the Slack channel uh, and other social media, the LinkedIn group and stuff, and see if anybody can school us a little bit. Maybe this is one of their, their things and they have that knowledge. So looking yep. forward to, to hearing people share that. Uh, well, Daniel, thank you very much for taking us through this. I'm glad that you did. And uh, thanks for teaching. Yep. Talk to you later. Talk to you next week. Yeah. Come hang out with Daniel, Chris, and hundreds of other AI practitioners in our community Slack. It's a cool place to be, not a lot of noise, some great signal, and best of all, it's totally free. Check it out at changelog.com slash community. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter for AI news and links, highlights from past episodes, and more. We are at Practical AI FM. We'd love to have you following along. Thanks to Daniel and Chris for hosting Practical AI week in and week out. To the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder for the excellent beats you hear on all Changelog podcasts. To our sponsors who have our back, Fastly, Linode, and LaunchDarkly. And to you for listening. We appreciate your time and attention. That's all for now. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.